Good morning, good evening, and uh, good afternoon to all of you on the call today. Um, thank you for joining us for developing a high quality research proposal, the FIP Foundation and ECPG Professional Innovation Grant. My name is Amanda Cabinets and I'm the ECPG Chairperson of Projects. I'm a clinical pharmacy specialist uh, in pediatric hematology and oncology at Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters in the United States. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. The recording will be available later on our website for you to, to view at www.events.fip.org. You can ask questions during the, uh, during the presentation in the Q&A box provided. And you can provide feedback after the webinar at webinars at FIP.org. And make sure that you are a member of FIP by joining at the website seen below. FIP ECPG would like to give a huge thank you to the FIP Foundation for supporting this online event and for supporting this grant for our members. It would not be possible without their support. This is what today's program will look like. Um, we're honored to have Mr. Andy Gray here with us today to do an introduction of the FIP Foundation and ECPG Professional Innovation Grant. Then we'll have a brief review of the application requirements from Usman Abubakar. Um, then Dr. Jack Collins will talk to us about how to improve your professional innovation grant research proposal. And then we'll have plenty of time for a question and answer session for you because we wanna make sure that you get the most out of this presentation and that you can submit your best proposal. Here are our learning objectives for today. We'll review the application requirements for the Professional Innovation Grant Research Proposal, to understand the characteristics of a strong research proposal, and to describe methods for improving a research proposal. So now I have the privilege of introducing Mr. Andy Gray. Um, Mr. Andy Gray is a pharmacist whose research interests include policy analysis, rational medicines use, and the application of antiretroviral therapy in resource-constrained settings. He's a senior lecturer in the Division of Pharmacology, Discipline of Pharmaceutical Sciences, at the School of Health Sciences, University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa. He has served FIP in a number of leadership roles. He's currently a director of the FIP Foundation for Education and Research. Widely published, he served as a reviewer for a number of international and local journals, is associate editor of the South African Pharmaceutical Journal, is section editor of the Journal of Pharmaceutical Policy and Practice, and serves on the editorial boards of the International Journal of Clinical Pharmacy, Health Systems and Reform, and BMC Health Services Research. He has also been a member of the editorial committee of the South African Health Review. Mr. Gray has reviewed funding applications for several agencies, including the Health Systems Trust, National Research Foundation, Medical Research Council, and Unitaid. He is clearly an expert in the field, and we are so happy to have him with us today. Mr. Gray. Thank you very much, Amanda, and good day to everyone. It's my privilege today to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of the FIP Foundation for Education and Research. As our title explains, the broad mission and vision of the foundation is to support FIP by improving global health, by inspiring philanthropy that drives education and research, leadership development, connections and collaborations. So FIP's vision overall is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality and affordable medicines and health technologies, as well as from pharmaceutical care services provided by pharmacists in collaboration with others. And that really sets the scene for what the foundation does and for what this particular grant aims to do. So we have three broad areas of strategic goals for the foundation. The first, from our name is research, implementing or sustaining proven strategies that support research across pharmaceutical science, 
practice and education aligned with FIP's goals. But we also are very much focused on building connections and collaborations. One of those is Farmer Bridge, um, but looking at priority FIP projects and making sure that those who are engaged in driving this forward, the mission of FIP are connected and can collaborate. And then the third is leadership development. So we want to support individual leadership development for practitioners, educators, and scientists and grow future FIP leaders. So linking all of those together, you can see why it is so important for the foundation to support the early career pharmaceutical group in looking for these innovative ideas and supporting through limited amounts of money and a short project, something that not only makes a difference, but grows our human capital for years to come. So I don't want to steal the thunder of the next presenters and I will hand straight back now to Amanda to introduce them. But I look forward to hearing from those who are designing the system, but also have proven so successful in the past in producing not only grant um, applications, but the outcomes from those grants. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much. And thanks for being here today. So now I'll introduce to you Dr. Abu Bakar Usman. He's a clinical assistant professor at the College of Pharmacy at Qatar University in Qatar. He obtained his Bachelor of Pharmacy from Amado Bello University and it received a master and a PhD in clinical pharmacy from University Thames, Malaysia. His research interest revolves around antimicrobial utilization, antimicrobial stewardship, and clinical pharmacy related studies. Dr. Abu Bakar has published over 40 articles in peer reviewed international journals and serves as an editorial board member for BMC Medical Education. He currently serves as the FIP ECPG Professional Innovation Grant Coordinator. Usman, take it away. Right, thank you very much for the introduction, Amanda. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all our participants today, depending on where you are listening to us from. So today I'm going to, in my part, I'm going to review the application requirements and uh, I will focus on the uh, application form specifically. So the first part is that in uh, before that, I would like to just talk briefly about the eligibility criteria for you to be eligible to apply for the ECPG Professional Innovation Grant. First, you have to be a member of FIP. Okay, and being a member of FIP, you have to be a member of the ECPG. That's the Early Career Pharmaceutical uh, uh, Group. Beside that, previous winners of the awards are not eligible to apply. And uh, we welcome people to apply as a group. But if you need to submit a group work, that group work has to submit and also be submitted under one name. So you are eligible to apply for, to submit one application, or that's one proposed project during this cycle. So you cannot submit more than one. In addition, you also need to bear in mind that uh, the grant should be used solely for the, work, for the project that has been uh, awarded and you are not allowed to seek additional funds for the execution of the project outside the fund provided by the FIP. So now I will now focus on the uh, talk of the day, which is the review of the application requirements. First, if you look at the application form we provided, you will see that the first part is the project identification. What projects are you proposing in the application? So first we want to see the project title. So try to make the project title very, um, uh, informative, precise, and very straightforward. So here you can uh, develop, you can uh, include what you want to achieve in the project in your project title. In addition, you may also include the neat type of the study design, whether your study is an observational study, if it's a cross-sectional cross study, retrospective or, or, or prospective studies, or if it's an interventional study, what kind of interventional study are you proposing? Is it a quasi-experimental study like you have in the before and after the intervention group, uh, uh, project? And where is the location of the study? What country is the study? Will the study with the proposed project be conducted? Is it a multinational study? 
If so, you can include that in your title. So from there, you begin to what? Uh, win the attention of your uh, reviewers because eventually the proposals will have to be reviewed by a team of almost five or six reviewers. In addition to this, you also need to have a summary of your proposed project. And the summary, the summary is just like the abstract of your proposed project. So in the summary, try to include the problem statements. That is the rationale of your research. Why do you think that, that, pro that uh, problem if identified is worth attending, is worth researching? In addition, you need to also mention your objective, the objective of your proposal and the method, as well as the expected research outcomes. So this could be summarized in about 200 words. I think we have a word limit. So you just try to choose your words carefully and try to have a very good uh, summary. The second part, which is the applicant information. So here we use this part to verify who is the applicant. We want to, because there you also need to provide us with your FIP uh, membership number so that we can verify and see if you are eligible or not. In addition, we also use this to screen and see if there is anyone submitting more than one application. Okay, so please do remember that, do remember to fill out this part completely and remember to sign the application form before you submit the application. So the third part, which is the part that will be evaluated by our reviewers. I think this is the most important part you need to pay attention to because this is the part that we will send out to the reviewers to grade and then eventually we take the average of the scores and then select a winner. So in the, the project description, you will have, there are different sections and with what limit for each uh, of the section, you have a background where you are allowed to, where you will describe what is the issue. So under the background, you introduce your, pro your project or the topic of the project and then you provide the problem statements. What is the problem? Why do you think it's a problem? Why do you think that problem what is worth researching? And uh, you provide an objective. After that, you provide the objectives of the research. What are the objectives? For the objective, you make them very straightforward, very concise, that they can easily be understood by those who are going to review the proposal. So after the objectives, you can also provide us, you can also provide the, I think there are sections there where you provide information about the significance of the project. And under the significance of the project, I need to stress that you need to clearly demonstrate that the proposed project has a direct clinical application. Because I think this is one of the, this is one part that most applicants miss out in the previous, from the previous years. We've seen very uh, good, excellent proposals in the past years. But those, those applicants could not demonstrate in the proposal how that project will have a direct clinical application after the, at the end of the project. So this is very important for you to also describe that in the, uh, in the uh, proposal. So under the methods, the method you need to have the, a very clear method. Your methodology should uh, try to include your study design. What kind of study design are you uh, trying to, uh, what kind of study design will be used to execute the project? So we welcome you to submit whether observational studies or interventional studies. So if it is an observational study, what type of observational study are you using? Are you using cross-sectional study design? Are you using prospective study design, retrospective study design, or point prevalence study design? Whatever the study design is, try to include it there. So after the study design, you also include the study setting. Where are you going to conduct the study? Is it in a hospital, in a community pharmacy setting, or where? Is it a single center study or a multi-center study? So that people will begin to know from there how you intend to what, execute your project. The third thing is a study population. Who are those that will be included? What's the study population that, you, that's in, that is involved in your project? Under that, you can also have the inclusion criteria very clearly. You don't have to write so long, just in a very uh, in few points, you describe who will, is eligible to be included in the project and who is not eligible. That is for the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So I believe there is a word limit of about 300 words for the method section. So we also appreciate it if you could just uh, tell us what's the sample size. You don't have to necessarily show the calculation. If you have, if you have enough words to do that, that's fine. You can also include that. The study under this, this is all under the study population. So under the study population, you have the inclusion criteria, you have the exclusion criteria, you have the sample size determination. How did you decide determine the sample size? After that, you have what? 
the study tool. What tool will you be using to collect your data? Are you using a questionnaire? Are you adapting or adopting the questionnaire? Are you developing a questionnaire? If so, how will you develop it? How will you validate it? How will you do the reliability testing? So these are the things, sort of things that distinguish between a very good proposal and the proposal that may not scale through. So you try to look into those details. In addition, if your project is an interventional study, you also need to briefly mention about the intervention. What kind of intervention are you implementing and what time, at what point do you want to implement the intervention? Who are the intervention targeted at? Are your interventions targeted at pharmacists? Are they targeted at nurses or are they targeted at physicians in order to improve the quality of uh, care that is provided to the patient if you have a project that has to do with hospital setting? So after that, you talk about your data collection. Briefly, you can also describe your statistical analysis. How are you going to analyze? Briefly, you don't have to give us detail of how of uh, the methods or the test that will be used. Just describe this is the tool or the, this is the uh, tool that you're going to use for your analysis and this is how you're going to present your results. So in addition to this, we I think there's a section where we also want you to talk about mentorship because we do understand that not everyone has a research background, probably from because we, we obtain our, our bachelors from different uh, countries. In some countries, I think uh, mandatory undergraduate research project is not uh, present. So if you do feel that you need, uh, you don't have, you're not confident enough or your proposal needs to be uh, improved by a mentor, we recommend that you identify a mentor from your own setting. So the role of that mentor is to help you to improve the quality of your proposal and then to help you if you are awarded the grant with the execution of the project. So we advise that you carefully uh, search for a mentor. In case you cannot find a mentor, you can email us and we will be able to identify a mentor that will be willing to work with you. Next slide, please. So for this part, which is the part I mentioned that will be assessed, we are going to assess this based on five criteria. And uh, I will advise that you try to make it very clear and concise. Okay, try to limit yourself to the number of words that are provided, uh, that are required for each of these section. For the objective, please make the objective very clear. If it is clear and measurable, Okay, it should be something that we uh, that is obviously measurable. You don't have to include something that we begin to doubt whether it is measurable or not, and then it's achievable. Because do remember that one of the criteria is that this project has the project that is awarded that will be eventually awarded has to be completed in twelve months, one year. So we expect that within this period you should be able to complete the project within this uh, period, and you have to demonstrate that in your proposal. For the method, you can organize it make it well organized, detailed, and then you try to match it with your objective. Well, because we'll be able to, we'll, we'll try to check to see if the method will be, I will actually answer the questions that are the research questions you want to uh, achieve at the beginning of your project. Next slide, please, Amanda. So for the mentorship, I've talked about mentorship, you identify a mentor, someone who has expertise in that area of uh, your research, uh, of the research you, you propose. And then uh, if you have difficulties in finding a mentor, please do contact us at ECPG. Uh, I think the, uh, the email will be shared later on in the, chat, uh, in the chat, under the chat. You can contact us and we will identify a mentor in that area who will be able to work with you to improve the proposal. And then if you are eventually awarded the grant to help you with the execution of the project. So please do remember, check your, your application forms carefully before you submit, because incomplete applications will eventually not be uh, sent to the reviewers and eventually cannot be awarded the grant. So try to also submit your application before the deadline. Any application submitted after the deadline will not be entertained. Thank you very much. Amanda? Thank you so much, Usman. That was a great overview. Um, and now, I'm happy to introduce to you Dr. Jack Collins, who will be speaking with us about his experience with the Professional Innovation Grant. Dr. Collins is a practicing community pharmacist and lecturer in Sydney, Australia. His research interests include self-care, mental health, health policy, and health equity. Jack is an executive committee member of the Social and Administrative Pharmacy Section and was the 2018 recipient of the FIP, at that time YPG, 
Pharmacist Award for Professional Innovation, and for his work in uh, exploring implicit pharma implicit bias in pharmacists. Jack, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, Amanda, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us online today. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of my experience uh, with the grant, uh, a few tips from me. I'm not strictly going to share the exact details of my project proposal because I'm not sure how useful that will be because you have to come up with your own innovative ID, but I'll share a bit of my story and my own experiences and hope that that's useful. And of course, happy to take any questions about that um, after my presentation as well. So I'm quite transparent to say that my first application was in 2017, my first year of my PhD studies, um, and that was not successful. So it's not necessarily that you go straight in and you win um, the first time. My first application was unsuccessful. It was my first time writing a grant. For those of you that have looked at the application form and from listening to Usman, you'll notice that the, um, the word count is quite tight and even that in itself is challenging is thinking about how you express yourself clearly in a very small number of words. So I had heard about the grant um, as well as FIP through some colleagues. So I had never been to an FIP Congress before. 2017 in Seoul was my first one. And I kind of came home from Seoul, thought, well, it was a little bit of a shame that I didn't get it this time, but you know, let's give it another go because we can't expect to get everything the first time that we do it. So in 2018, um, I applied again, and that was the year that I was successful. So it was far easier for me to do it the second time because I was quite familiar with the process and the application form. And I also saw it as a bit of a chance to tighten up my application. I got out the application that I submitted the previous year and kind of went through that myself and thought, where could I have improved? What do I think may have been um, some of the things that perhaps might have reduced how well I was scored when that was reviewed? Because I had a new idea the second time around, it's not necessarily that I just took the previous application and really tightened it up. My second idea was far more innovative than the first one that I submitted. And overall, my application was much stronger. I spent a lot longer contemplating the idea and putting it together and a lot longer refining the application as well. So it's not really a matter of just drafting the application going, great, it's done, send it off. I think you probably do have to give it couple of iterations, particularly with the tight word counts, which will probably go to write a section that might be, say, 300 words. And by the time you're done, particularly in the methods, for example, it could be anywhere up to somewhere like 700 words. And you think, how am I going to basically cull this in half? So it's definitely an iterative process. If you have a mentor or someone around you, maybe even someone who isn't um, in research or isn't too familiar with pharmacy to read it, that can be quite useful as well. Because essentially what you have to do is communicate your idea in a very small number of words to the people that are reviewing it. And I mean, this is the same for every grant, not just this one, but for many of you, this is probably your first grant um, that you're applying for. So if someone who's less familiar with you and your work and the project um, is the person that reads it, such as just a friend or a family member, they can also tell you they think it makes sense and how um, straightforward it is for them to read. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the slides to come back. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Meta. And so what I did for my, um, the one that was successful was I explored implicit racial bias in community pharmacists. And that was the first time that had been done anywhere in the world. Um, we've only ever done it before me in tests, self-reports and in students. So it was quite novel. The method that I approached, uh, that I proposed was very novel. I sent covert actors into the pharmacy um, of different races to see how they were treated. So a lot of aspects of the project, it wasn't just necessarily what I was looking at, it was the method I was using as well. Um, that was all very novel. I pretty much got straight into it not long after I returned from Congress. So I had been in Europe away from Australia for about eight weeks. I had to settle back into life in Australia, coming back from Congress and get straight into hit the ground running. That meant that I had a few other things I was doing my PhD that time that I had to pause. So that's something else you need to consider is how, what's going on around the time that you're intending to implement the project if you are successful. The timeline is quite tight. 12 months is not a huge amount of time to do everything from start to finish. So if you have to get research ethics clearance, for example, recruitment, 
um, I don't know, you might have posters you have to design for recruitment, all kinds of different factors that you have to think about. Is there anything that you perhaps can think about or at least do a precursory draft just in case you are successful so that you have something prepared and you're good to go as soon as you're successful and you come back? Because, yeah, it's hard to think about all these different things beforehand, but it certainly hits you in the face once you get to the point you have to start. So throughout that 12 months, you also have to write some progress reports as well as a final report for both the foundation um, and ECPG as well. So that will detail where the money's gone, what you've achieved in that time, the potential impact and any preliminary results you might have as well. So what I did with the grant was the thousand euros um, paid for the actors that I sent into the pharmacies as well as some transcription services, which I certainly wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been able to do without the grant. I had no research funding to do these kinds of things really when I was a PhD student. So it was certainly really helpful for me to do that. And this is a new research area, as I mentioned, and I did get a publication, which is really exciting. So this is kind of a tangible output of what I managed to do with um, the project that I submitted for the grant. I also got the opportunity to work with an academic outside of my direct area and gain some new research skills, obviously develop some experience in writing grant applications, having done it twice. And it also really drove me to generate new research ideas. I don't think I necessarily would have sat down and thought about doing this project if the grant wasn't there to prompt me. So even if you do come up with something, write the grant that's not successful, think about is that something that you could do without the funds or in a slightly modified way with less budget or more time or whatever it is, I think the grant really prompts you to think about those things, which is a really good side benefit. Um, as the grant winner, you get to attend the following year's um, FIP Congress. So that covers your registration, accommodation and flights, um, which is really great if you've never attended a Congress before. Um, you may not have the opportunity to otherwise without receiving the grant. So that's an awesome benefit. And that's me presenting my research poster there in Abu Dhabi. So you do present the findings as a poster presentation, um, as well as at the ECPG meeting. And so by the time you get to the following year's Congress, you really do have to have some kind of tangible output and at least some preliminary results so that you're able to share them with everyone. So that everyone can also see how like, the foundation gets to see the amazing work that they're funding through the grant scheme as well. And of course, by attending Congress, it's a great opportunity for networking and people will know who you are because your face gets plastered over um, the screen during the opening ceremony of Congress. So people will come up to you and talk to you about your work and things as well, which is a great opportunity, particularly as an early career um, pharmacist or pharmaceutical scientist. If I think about these areas in terms of writing a stronger application, basically anytime you're writing a grant, you really need to justify why your particular project should be funded. So explaining really clearly, there's this money sitting there, why should it go to you? And how will you measure the impact? It's one thing to come up with a really innovative and fantastic idea and implement it. But if you have no way of measuring that outcome, it's really not worthwhile doing it in the first place, to be honest. So make sure that your outcome measures are really clear and they're realistic. Whatever your measure is, you have to be able to obtain that measure from the project you're proposing. It's no good really choosing a measure such as mortality rates or anything like that, that you need a longer term um, to see. Of course, that could be a potential long-term impact you might postulate, but it needs to be something ideally, some kind of measurement that you can make within that 12 month time frame. It's not even necessarily 12 months. It's probably closer to 10 to 11 by the time you've found out that you've won, you complete the project and you need to prepare and submit um, your abstract and everything else um, for the following year's Congress. When you're coming up with your plan, is there a clear path? Does it all make sense? If you read it top to bottom, can you see, okay, this is what the person wants to do, the problem they've identified, and they can very clearly articulate and explain to me how they're going to go about doing it. You want the assessors to be able to follow through your grant, make sure that your outcome measures, your proposed impact, your problem, your methods, they're all intertwined and they all address each other and um, they're related. As I mentioned, the timeliness, honestly, it has to look feasible. If, you, if you're gonna change the world and cure cancer in 12 months, it's not going to really look favorable. So you are possibly better off choosing a smaller component of a larger study you might have in mind or a little bit of a feasibility test 
because that's more feasible to implement within that 12 month time frame. Although you might have an awesome idea if it looks like there's no way you're going to be able to do that in 12 months and the assessors are experienced, they're going to have some kind of idea of what's going to be feasible in the time frame. And think about, is there a way that you can take just a smaller portion of that for the purpose of the grant? Particularly given that you are not um, supposed to use any other funding sources in order to undertake the research itself. Absolutely, the pharmacist's role needs to be clear. So take a look at the FIP development goals. Those are readily available on the FIP website and see if there's certain ways where you can map your application to those. And if you can, I would call them out. This is mapped with development goal 10 or nine or whatever it might be to show that your project and your plan aligns overall with the strategy. Just a few closing remarks from me. If you have an idea, submit an application. Besides the time and perhaps the stress of pulling your hair out, trying to cut out um, some words to meet the word count, it's really no skin off your nose to submit an application. So if you have an idea, you may as well give it a shot. As Usman mentioned, find a mentor if you don't have one already. I was ready to have, um, sorry, I was quite fortunate to have a mentor um, assist me with my applications. If you don't find someone, it's great that we now have this scheme where you'll get linked with someone as well if perhaps um, you need someone to help you during the course of the project too. As I've mentioned, be realistic with what you can achieve in the timeline, but also within the budget. While a thousand euros is not a small sum of money, it's also not a large sum of money. So you can't do everything you might want to with that. So make sure that you make sort of a realistic projected budget for your project as well. Definitely be organised and keep a timeline. If you've never done a project, never had much experience in project management, um, you may need someone to kind of check in on you. Perhaps that's what your mentor can do is make sure that you're sticking to time. But certainly I would be breaking the project into parts in your own head at least with a clear timeline to make sure that you're staying on track. And as I said, don't be disheartened if you aren't successful the first time because I certainly wasn't. And keep in mind that every year you're benchmarked against the other applications. So you could have come second the previous year for all you know. And if you apply again, there's every chance that in that particular round, your idea might be the strongest. So that's it from me. Good luck, everyone. Thank you so much, Jack. So um, there are already a few questions in the Q&A box, um, and I would like to start off the questions um, with Dr. Collins and just say, um, Jack, would you be willing to share um, when you went back and you were reviewing your own application after the first year, would you maybe share with the participants some of the things that you identified looking back at your own um, proposal about things that maybe you wish you'd done differently or um, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it was a lot easier to review coming back to it months after I had written it with fresh set of eyes, because at the time I also, to be honest, wrote it in a relatively short amount of time, a bit close to the deadline. I was it frantically writing. And then by the time I got to come back and review it, I think the idea, although it was very interesting to me, probably was not particularly innovative. So that's for starters. It really needed to be something a little bit more innovative and exciting. Um, Reading through the proposed methodology and the proposed impacts, I think they were probably the weakest parts for me in that I didn't make a clear enough link between what I thought the proposed impacts of the project would be. It was a little bit vague and not particularly explicit. And I can imagine being in an assessor's um, shoes at that time, reading it and going, oh, so what? So I think that's kind of the thing you should be asking yourself at the end of the application. It's so what? So you're going to do this project that's great, but what do we do with the findings from it and what's the next step? Um, sorry, I'm Amanda, you're muted. Thank you, I'm sorry. Um, there is another question um, in the box for Jack about how you utilized your funding. I know you mentioned um, in your slides that you were able to pay the actors in the um, the transcripts. Do you have any other comments that you'd like to add about that? Um, I would have an exact breakdown somewhere. I think I managed to spend <laughs> 921 euros out of a thousand or something like that. So I got pretty close. 
Um, specifically, the actors were quite expensive, so they took up a lot of the money, the transcription, and I also bought products from the pharmacies when the actors went into them as well, so the funding also paid for that. The rest of the um, project admin, materials, transport, all of those kind of associated costs I just covered myself. Um, but yeah, the majority of the funds were to pay the actors to um, actually go into the pharmacies. Great, thank you. Um, all right, there's one question that says, who will read my proposal and what were the what will their expectations be? So the proposals are read by um, a group of people actually made up of individuals from ECPG um, and from the FIP Foundation. Um, and, and Andy, would you like to talk a little bit about what the expectations are? Um, I know in the application we have five criteria um, and what the points are that maybe Uzma can speak to, but. Andy, as someone who's reviewed a lot of proposals in your time, what would you say the expectations might be? So really, our expectations match up to what Jack has been explaining. It's clarity of presentation, measurability of outcomes, feasibility of, of really doing that within the time frame and with the budget that's asked for. And then having something at the end that we are going to be able to use, either as the start of a bigger project or a contribution to a, a bigger project, something that is not going to be just an end in itself. It's got to link in. Does it answer a question that's going to open, even if the research is done by someone else, a new um, avenue of work? And the key that, that Jack just kind of drifted past um, quickly is, where's the pharmacist in this? You know, there's so many health problems and there's so many medicines use problems. Is it very clear that we are highlighting and valuing the role of the pharmacist in the intervention or in the in the work that's being done? That's really a, a key aspect as well. But Osman can take you through the criteria. Thanks. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Andy, for your response. I think uh, Dr. Andy Profandi has already summarized what the, cri the criteria we use for evaluating the proposals. Like I mentioned earlier, we have five criteria, five criteria that we use to evaluate uh, each of the uh, applications, each of the applications. So those criteria, for those criteria, they will be scored for a total of 100 points by each of the reviewer. So at the end of the day, we take average of all the uh, scores and then the highest, the, the applicant with the highest point will be awarded the grant eventually if they fulfill all the criteria. So the first criteria is we want to see the significance and relevance of the projects. So that's why in your proposal, in describing the rationale of your study, you have to make us understand why that problem is an issue and why it is worth researching and why you should be given the grant to conduct the research. What is the impact of the problem you've identified on patient health outcome in terms of morbidity, in terms of mortality, in terms of patient quality of care, quality of life, and even the health uh, costs for the patient. So the second thing we look at is the, what is the uh, creativity and innovation. How innovative is your intervention if it's an interventional project? How is it original? And how does it address those issues you've actually raised in your problem statement? The third one is scientific accuracy. Scientific accuracy is where we look at the methodology. What do you, how, how was the, uh, the project designed? And does the design of the project, will, this, will the design of the project answer the objectives you've actually set out to achieve and to like in your proposal? The fourth uh, criteria which Jack has already, which Andy has already, I think, mentioned is the clarity of communication. How clear and precise and um, uh, concise is your word? Is the presentation of your proposal? And lastly, we see the feasibility. Can this project be implemented, be, con be conducted in a year? And will the results have an impact on patient? On will the result have a direct impact on patient healthcare and possibly be carried forward by someone else? in order to improve patient care. I think this is a summary of the five criteria. The first one, significance and relevance has 25 points. 
The second one is the creativity and innovation, 20 points. Scientific accuracy, 20 points as well. Clarity of communication, 15 points. And feasibility is 20 points. So total is 100 points. And this will be evaluated. Uh, we have a, a rubric that we will send to the evaluators to uh, evaluate each of the proposal that we receive. And then later on, take the total of the points. And then the person with the highest point will be awarded the, uh, the grant. Thank you. Great, thank you, Usman. Um, there is a question in the chat. Um, can we use a data collector for the data collection process? Um, I don't think there's anything in the grant um, rules that say that you cannot do that. The project just has to be carried out within the one year time frame and within the budget. Um, another question we have here. Um, I am not a member of FIP yet, but I'm looking forward to joining as a member. May I know the process and criteria to become an FIP member? Um, yes, there will be a link at the end to take you to the FIP page um, to sign up for membership. You can also just Google um, join FIP um, and the link should be easy to find. Um, also, for this grant eligibility, you must be a member of ECPG, which means you have graduated with your first professional pharmacy degree within the last eight years. Um, so you must be a member of FIP and within your first eight years of practice. Um, another question, um, what are the research areas and where could we find them on the internet or do we choose the research objectives ourselves? Um, the research objectives are chosen yourself. Um, but the application does list um, several items about how um, of clinical themes that you could choose from. Also, I would highly recommend that you check out the FIP development goals and make sure that your project is aligning with FIP um, strategic plans and what are uh, uh, what the development goals are and how they would tie into that. All right, we'll wait just another moment. I think we've answered most of the questions. And I'll also take this time to give the speakers um, a moment to, if anyone has any last words of advice, anything else that they'd like to share with our audience today. Amanda, perhaps just one word from me. Um, apart from membership, there's no cost to this. So don't be shy, stick your neck out um, and, and put something in. It's not only a useful exercise if you win, but it is a very useful exercise, both as a practitioner involved in quality in, um, improvement projects and but perhaps as a postgraduate student who's looking at a research project. So there are gains for everyone involved. Um, a newly qualified academic could also take part in this um, and that could also build your skills. Thanks. Absolutely, that's still one of my favorite pieces of advice that I got um, as a new practitioner was um, always make someone else tell you no. If you have an idea, if you want to apply for something, if there's something that you're interested in, always put yourself out there. Um, the worst that they can say is no, or maybe try again. So that's great advice. Thank you. I'll check the box one more time. All right, without seeing any, any other question, we will wrap up the session today. Here you can find the call for the FIP at Foundation and ECPG Professional Innovation Grant. Um, scan the QR code at the image below. Um, make sure that you meet the deadline. The deadline is the 14th of May um, before midnight Central European summertime. Um, if you do have any questions about your application, you can contact us at ecpg at fip.org. Um, that's also the email that you can use if you are struggling to find a mentor, um, and you would like us to try to help you find someone, um, we're happy to help in that process. But you'll need to do that very early. The deadline is just about one month away now. So um, if you still need to also find a mentor, I would recommend reaching out as soon as possible. 
You can also check all future FIP digital events at the site seen below. This webinar today is also being recorded and will be available later on um, the FIP webinar channel. And you can also check it out on YouTube if you'd like to rewatch, listen to words of wisdom from all of our speakers um, as you're working on your application. Finally, we'd love for you to follow us on social media. You can find all of our handles below for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, we're always posting other opportunities for ECPG members um, and letting you know what our members have been up to. Finally, thank you so much for attending today. Again, there is our email address uh, for contact. You can scan the QR code at the bottom of this slide and it will take you directly to the FIP membership page um, if you would like to join as a member of FIP so that you are eligible for this grant. Um, I will check the question and answer box one last time. All right. Thank you all for being here today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of our speakers.